My wife is sick and tired of this necktie. I wear it all the time. It wore out. I wear it because I like it. I've got the same wife I had for 31 years. I got the... I wear the same pinstripe suit, got the same Ford automobile, don't change. That's interesting, we don't change. Basic values don't change because we tend to be creatures of, of uh, habit. We get a certain self a sense of satisfaction from our habits, a certain sense of security, false though it may be. We tend, therefore, as, a, as individuals to resist those changes, to be unwilling to regard tomorrow as a new frontier. For some, the prospect of change is a frightening thing because we lived yesterday, we know what that was, and so there are those timid souls in our society who would roll back the clock relive our past or hold everything in place. Now that has an appeal to it. The good old days is appealing. Well, it ain't for everybody. I can tell you that. My wife and I were married in 1950 and, and we were five years into our married life before we had running water in the house. And there's something about Minnesota winters and outdoor plumbing you don't ever forget. <laughs> those, those are the good old days that we can do without. But the fact of the matter is that there is a resistance to trying something that's out of the ordinary. Tremendous pressures applied to you as individuals and on you as an organization over these past 20 years because you have tried something different. And so the heat will stay on those who have the courage to try something more effective. And I commend you for having that courage. And I know that you'll continue. But I grew up on a farm in the Canadian line on the Dakota side of my state of Minnesota. In the 1930s, mother and dad had eight cows and a uh, hundred chickens and a turkey uh, flock and a few sheep and a few horses and a garden that mother canned. They sold a little butter, traded a few eggs, cream occasionally, once in a while a pig. But mother and dad had, and I grew up on, a highly diversified, independent, subsistence family farm. There were eight million such farms in the 1930s. And mother and dad were independent. They didn't depend on the Ayatollah Khomeini or on the Russians or on OPEC or on anybody else. They depended on God Almighty and the New Deal. They asked no quarter and gave none. Didn't spend much, had no expense much, didn't earn much. Hard life. That's true. Farm programs were developed in the 1930s to cope with that kind of highly independent subsistence farming. Then along came World War II, following which we saw the development and application of high technology, hybrid corn and modern farm equipment and pesticides and fertilizers and machinery. And the character of our farm changed as we introduced expensive technology, the first things the folks decided was that they were going to get rid of the eight cows, and did, because I was tired of cleaning barn by hand. Next thing went the chickens, then the turkeys, then the sheep. Got specialized, got more equipment, yields doubled and tripled. And during the 1950s and 60s, we saw the results of this high technology. 
With the exploding production of that period, we had grain coming out of our ears. Government bin sites all over the United States, acreage allotments and marketing quotas, designed all in every instance to reduce the size of the farming factory because there was no place to store the grain. And so again, farm programs had been changed to accommodate the forces of that period. But during that time, we saw the family farm structure change substantially from a highly independent, diversified, in subsistence lifestyle of my mother and dad into a high-powered, rock'em, sock'em farming system that I was a part of when we started in 1950. Instead of having eight or nine separate sidelines on the farm, we have one or two specializations. And mother and dad spent full time farming 320 acres of land. And my wife and I farmed 1,200 acres during the 1950s, easier than mother and dad farmed a half section with high powered technology and machinery. But in the process, our expenses went out of sight. Machinery costs went out of sight. And then in the earlier part of the 1970s, a couple of major events drove home some points that we had never really looked at carefully enough. 1972, the Russians came into the markets of the United States and became the owners of the world's only reserve of grain. Prices tripled and they cashed in on an enormous windfall profit. Government didn't know how to cope with those circumstances and so out of blind frustration, government imposed embargoes, price controls on beef, through a series of activities designed to try to curb inflation generated by Soviet activity in the U.S. grain markets and by worldwide economic events. In 1973, OPEC was formed. And the price of oil went from $4 to $8 a barrel, and then they embargoed. Stopped shipping oil to this country, and suddenly we saw how vulnerable we had become. We were no longer a contented island of self-sufficiency, fed by 8 million highly independent family enterprises, but indeed, uh, we were now being impacted by countries abroad that could cut off our oil and bring us to their knees. And so during these past seven, eight years, we have once again changed our agricultural policies to accommodate the forces of change. This year, exports will earn $40 billion to the economy of the United States. A great deal has been said about uh, the need for expanding exports, and uh, there can be little question about that. But it raises certain problems. And so as we go into 1981 and uh, debate the agricultural policy, it's time that we take a look back over our shoulders, take a look at what has happened to us, so we can sort these things out and decide on an appropriate federal role in our lives. For as long as I can remember, and during my six years in Congress, one of the most frustrating activities of my life in the Congress in particular was the lack of any consensus within the agricultural community on the proper role of government. On one hand, we had those people who said, get off my back and out of my pockets. I don't need government. Leave me alone. On the other side, we had persons who were demanding that government set price supports at 100% of parity and take over the functioning of the markets. We had NFO that said, we need certain protection under the laws but that we should use our power as free citizens to bargain collectively in a free society. <laughs> the result was confusion and chaos. 
There are 40 members of the Congress of the United States, of the House of Representatives, who come from farming districts that know what collective bargaining means. But there are 395 who do not come from farming districts that haven't the foggiest notion of what farming's about. They think that milk comes from cartons. And they have the majority power in the House of Representatives. And so they have become confused. So to try to see if we could get to the bottom of all this a year ago, we launched what we describe as the structure study to find out, in fact, what is going on out here? What about the family farm? Is it a, an institution in jeopardy? Does the family farm have any value? Or is that an old-fashioned notion that went when horses became obsolete? And so we are now concluding those structure studies, the results of which will be published in January and will be in the public domain for you, your leaders, your colleagues, and our countrymen to digest and argue over as the Farm Bill is developed in Congress in 1981 and beyond. The structure study shows some very interesting and, I think, important facts. Six percent of the farms in the United States, that's 162,000, produce 52 percent of the total value of food and fiber production in this country. Six percent produce half of everything that's grown and sold in the marketplace. That same 6 percent, 160,000 farms, also control more than 25 percent of the agricultural assets, and they have an average net worth of nearly a million dollars per farm. When their off-farm income of about $11,000 a piece is counted, that group of 162,000 farms has an average family income before taxes of more than $63,000 per year. At the other end of the scale are about 35% of the farms, each with gross sales of less than $2,500 a year. Those farms, while they're defined as, farming, as farms by the census people, are much too small to keep the family busy. But those farms have little debt, and they have an average off-farm income of $17,000 a year, putting those farm couples at right around the national average per capita income for two persons in this, these United States. Then we have those in the middle, the 800,000. When we look at those in the middle, those who sell between $10,000 and $40,000 worth of products a year, we see the real squeeze. Government programs provide them less income. Tax policy discriminates against them compared with large-scale farms. They have less net family income. They have higher debt, and they have no chance of getting an on-farm job. And so the squeeze is on. The study shows other matters which come as no surprise. That there's poverty found in these United States on farms of all sizes, big and small. That there are persons in this country who are either a slave to the machinery company or land poor. Young families who started in the early 1970s and ran into a drought or two or three, as has happened in many of the southern states and other places, with financial problems that are disastrous. 
The study shows that the great overwhelming preponderance of federal price support benefits and tax subsidies flows to those largest 162,000 farms. The small and average family farms in the United States cannot compete against those kinds of enormous tax subsidies. And so, the question that we have to ask first of all, does the family farm as an institution in this country have any value? Is there anything useful to the old Jeffersonian principle that land should be widely held and widely dispersed? There are those who will argue that land should flow to that group which can pay the most money. And that concentration of land in itself is an end to more efficient agriculture. A theory which our structure study is going to demolish. The study shows that if we ended the tax subsidies that now flow to speculators in farmland, there's no way they would stay in business in competition with a hardworking family farm. We're looking at matters which mostly you and I have taken for granted. Farmland values have tripled in the last 10 years. Driven by factors that have nothing to do with farming. Every day, almost, a young family comes into the office of FHA and says to our local representatives, they want to make a loan to buy the place on which they live, usually tenants. Settling an estate or whatever. Neighbors put a price on the land and it's always at least twice of what it's worth. And so the question that we have to wrestle with in our FHA is, do we make that young family a loan they can't possibly pay off from earnings? Or do we turn them down? We have been making those loans, but I must tell you something you already know, you don't borrow your way into prosperity. And We have been making those loans on those highly leveraged inflated farm values and today we have more than $30 billion in FHA credits out there. An all-time record high. I'm not particularly proud of that fact. But the alternative would have been to turn down those applicants and say no, we are not going to attempt to finance this farm. And that in my view would have been a worse choice. We do, though, need to get at some of the root causes of why or what drives farmland values. Is it a good thing to have land inflation at double the national rate of inflation? Is it a good thing to have a policy that will, in the next 10 years, drive Illinois farmland to $15,000 an acre? That's where it's headed. What does that mean? We need to think carefully about that. And farmland values are driven by factors which have nothing to do with farming. Speculation mostly, public trust accounts, pension funds, persons with big incomes looking for a tax shelter. There is a long list of reasons why people buy farmland. It has nothing to do with the rate of return. And the problem is that family farms, especially those who are getting started, have no chance. In competition with someone who's looking for a shelter for his or her million dollar outside income. And so it's time we think carefully about tax policy in the United States. That's a tough thing to discuss because mostly some of us get some of those benefits. We have to ask ourselves, would you and I be willing to give up the capital gains tax treatment on unlimited amount of land if it meant that we could slow down the rate of speculation in farmland? 
Would you and I be willing to put some limits on the investment credit for farm equipment if it meant that we could cut the rate of inflation by 50% in farm machinery? Are we willing to make those tough trade-offs is the kind of question that you and I have to ask ourselves because that's where the action is, my friends. It's in tax policy. And so we need to, as we will, publish our findings. And there will be a big explosion when these reports hit the streets because we're going to be getting into some areas that are critically sensitive. Persons who have enjoyed an enormous federal subsidy but had it all masked by the dignity of the tax code. Now, I have no hope that we can change tax laws in 1981. Not with an incoming administration that is not experienced. No new administration is experienced. I do not mean to discredit Mr. Reagan. I was not experienced in my job either when I came in four years ago. But tax policy will have to be debated. And over the next several years, I hope we can bring the Congress to the job of examining carefully and critically some of the fundamental values in land ownership patterns in these United States. Look carefully at the marketing structure on a global scale. How do we deal with the Russians? Big fight in the last election campaign. You and I tended up to choose up sides meaning no disrespect, not even critical. The problem is that government is not sophisticated enough in these challenging times in which we live. We tend to want to put on a patch, just say, well, let's put on another patch and maybe the problem will go away. My friends, it won't work. We have to get back to basics, back to fundamentals. And so during these next few years, there's an ever greater need for progressive thought. There's an ever greater need for free organizations to represent themselves. There's an ever greater need for thoughtful study on the part of persons in and out of government about what government should do in trade policies. What do you do with the Russians? Do we let them run over Poland? and still sell them grain? Of course not. What about trade policy? We are now farming 35 million acres of fragile lands in these United States, much of which was brought about back in 1974 and 5 when the cattle prices were a disaster and beans went to 10 bucks. People got starved out of the livestock business, plowed up the grassland and put it to corn or beans. Soil losses, 15 tons of topsoil per acre per year that cannot be sustained. It will be a barren wasteland. Question, should we do anything about it? My wife and I own a section of land in Minnesota, and under the laws of our state, we're allowed to destroy that land. And yet there's another law, higher calling, God's law, that says no, you and I are strangers and guests, and we should behave like strangers and guests. <laughs> and that law should be written to recognize that you and I are but tenants here for one lifetime, and that we have an obligation and a responsibility to our family, to our country, and to God Almighty, to leave this land and leave this country in a better condition than when we found it, and that we need to adjust our attitudes and our values so that we act individually and in our own way and on our own rights, enhance and strengthen the public interest. In my view, I'm frightened by some of the tendencies to exploit the moment to cut and run, take advantage of the situation today at the expense of a much more profound and fundamental set of values and interests. 
in trade matters. I'm under tremendous pressure to continue to expand the sales of grain overseas. My friends, at what price? We have to ask ourselves this, because on 35 million acres of corn land in the United States, for every ton of corn we ship abroad, we send them two tons of topsoil. Does it make sense? Of course not. And so we have to look at the many things that go into this incredibly complicated but vitally important business called farming. Our burdens are many, yours and mine. Four years ago, I was in Rome. While there, as an official of the United States attending an international food conference, I was granted an audience with Pope John Paul I. I'll never forget his words in his last days in this world. His Holiness said to me in private that we in the United States have a very heavy burden because, His Holiness said, we have so very much to share. We do have a heavy burden, but I'm convinced with the vitality, with the creativity, with the commitment that you and your colleagues have shown and provided your leadership, that there are going to be answers found to these matters, and I urge you to continue the good work, and God bless you. Goodbye.